Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1975 Italian giallo film, The Police Are Blundering in the Dark. That's not the original title, though. The original title was The Salad Garden, and apparently this film was made much earlier, but I'm going to talk about that, and we'll get into it. This, this is an interesting one. I will tell you up front that this is one of the films that I might have to rate it two separate ways, because... It's not a good film, but I enjoy it for how bad it is, basically, and how funny the bad stuff is. So, yeah. Uh, written and directed by Halia Colombo. Um, that's it. Halia Colombo's only done this film, and that's a pseudonym. That's not the actual person's name. Uh, the actual person's name is Elio Palumbo, who was an Italian pop music producer and songwriter of the time. And he apparently was best known for writing the song, uh, it's a love ball ballad called Tornero. Haven't heard it. I plan to look it up at some point. Interesting. This film was actually shot in 1972, three years prior to its release date. And that's when it was titled Salad, uh, The Salad Garden. Then it ended up being retitled and released in 1975. Now, it's obviously it is a giallo film, but when it was put out when it was retitled and put out in 1975 they change it to the police are blundering in the dark which a lot of people are like why the police don't even show up until the last 10 minutes which is accurate but there's that title or, or the uh, title of a article in a newspaper that says the police are blundering in the dark that kind of just references that the overall case is not being handled well so i see where they get the title and I'm glad that they changed it from the Salad Garden for a few reasons. One, the Salad Garden sounds super stupid. And two, it um, tells you something about what's actually going on. Because as we know, by the end of this film, that's where the bodies are going. They're going in, in Dr. Dalla's Salad Garden. So yeah, so I'm glad they changed the title. Because it just, it just says too much. It just does. So anyway, the opening credits next to the bloody scissors in the grass is actually a very cool visual, and the image clashes, clashes with the very cheerful music that's playing. I kind of like that, and when I first saw that, I was like, oh, you know, this might be a really good film, because I watched it on The Forgotten Gialli from Vinegar Syndrome, Volume 1, and this was for, for Trauma, which I already have a review for on my channel, which I didn't really like that much. It's not even like a so good it's bad film. This is for The Police Are Blundering in the Dark. This one, thankfully, I actually like it from the standpoint of so bad it's good. So, uh, But I was thinking, maybe this is like a legitimate good giallo film. But it's not. It's not. It was, it was a setup in the beginning. Plus, the bloody scissors in the end don't even really mean anything. Because I don't think anyone got stabbed with scissors at any point. So it's just like, it was just for the visual. And that's the thing with this film, is there's a lot of just because stuff. This is a very out of left field film in my opinion uh, not well done but i'm glad it exists and i will watch it again for sure uh she almost makes it to the road before being killed in a horribly bad looking kill scene the very first opening kill where the woman is by the side of the road and she's talking to the person who you can't see which um as soon as you see that She's talking to someone, and it's you as the audience, basically the camera, and you can't see. You know she's going to die. Like, that's how Giallo works. And if you've seen enough, you just know it's coming. She gets chased. She gets killed as she's so close to the road, so close to getting help. But the kills look terrible. Like, that kill looks terrible. And usually your setup kill is going to be, like, what establishes everything. Um, it Just all the kills. They, they look bad in this. It's just fake blood. That's it. There's no prosthetics or anything. It's just... Looks bad, so you can tell it's low budget, low budget. Um, <laughs> the th uh, they throw a lot of characters at you kind of fast. I was kind of scrambling to like get everyone straight in my head immediately in the film because they do throw a lot of characters at you. There's a woman who died who you never end up hearing what her name is, and I guess you don't really care about her anymore. Then there's um, you know Erica and. Giorgio and the family in the big house is like Sarah and all these people. It's I was just like they were coming at me so fast. I was like, like oh my gosh, I got to keep these straight. But over time, they showed up enough that I, was, I got them straight. 
So Erica really doesn't want to be in the small town that she ends up stopping in, but Giorgio is too busy getting a piece to help. Now, I'm not quite sure, was that his wife? I think I may have missed their relationship there. Was that his girlfriend, his wife? I don't know. Either way, he was cheating um, because she calls and she's like, can you come get me? I'm My car's broken down in this random town. And he's just like, no, I'm at work. I'm doing work stuff for for work. Meanwhile, naked lady in bed with him, so not doing work, unless her name's work, in which case he is doing work. Um, <laughs> it's It really did sound like Erica was going to end up dying at that point, which obviously she does end up getting killed because how? Uh, why else are they setting up the fact that she's stranded there and then has to get a room from this, like, bodega, I guess, is what it is that she's kind of stopped at. Not quite sure, like a small town convenience store. I don't know. All I know, all I could see there is that they were selling cigarettes. That's the only thing I really remember or could see, and they're weird. And it was the family who was running that that had the son, who was the simpleton, who ends up showing up in a very weird way at the end of the film. We'll talk about that when I get there. The son holding the cat must be the prime red herring. Yes, the simpleton's son. I think he was set up to be a prime red herring in this film, at least initially, because he acts creepy, he looks creepy, he is creepy. All he does is, like, kind of carries around the cat and pets it and makes these kind of, like, guttural, grunting, weird, kind of animalish noises. And then you have the scene where he shows up in Erica's room and she's not fully clothed. I think she only has underwear on at this point. And he just start, comes over, is making weird noises, and just starts, like, touching her body all over. And she doesn't really do anything about it. Like, I would have screamed. I would have yelled if I were her. Just saying. But that's the charm of this film. Things don't make sense. They're not going to. So you get some really weird scenes. And for, like, for all these weird scenes, I was laughing out loud. Like, I was literally watching this by myself. And it takes a lot to get me to laugh out loud when I'm by myself. But I was doing that because it's so ridiculous. But I love it. I love it. Uh, it's such an awkward scene with the son feeling Erica up. I already talked about that. Um, and also, what was with the really long scene, uh, the naked ham sandwich eating that Erica was doing? Like, And this is what I'm talking about. There are a lot of kind of scenes of things going on way too long that aren't even interesting. And on top of that, there's usually no music going on either. So, like... Not using music at times is good for when there's, like, a tense moment or something with gravity that people need to, like, struggle with feelings to see how they feel about it. Not someone standing there eating a, a ham sandwich with no clothing on. That's not the time to not have music. Actually, that's not a scene to have in the film at all, but that's not the time to not have music because it's boring. And then not having music makes it more boring. And it was just, I mean, I assume that they had that scene and for how long it was to just kind of lull you into this sense of nothing's happening. And then that's when she gets attacked and killed. So, like, I get that, but it was just weird. Um, so when Giorgio shows up uh, in, in town and he's looking for Erica, which he's looking for her for, like, just a portion of a day. And then he forgets because women that I want to bang is basically what he's thinking. He's like, oh, I was I was here doing something? No, my, my penis said it's something different. Let's go over here. Um, so he meets Parisi, the, the guy who owns, who in the wheelchair, who owns the house, uh, who have it, has his photographing machine, which we'll talk about later. Uh, and he, when he meets Parisi, he says he's a journalist, which I don't, well, I guess maybe he is, because he does make a comment later in the film about, you know, this might end up being the story that kind of, like, breaks everything. So I guess he is a journalist. Initially, I thought it was a lie. So he meets Parisi, and Parisi's initial thing when he meets him is, like, I hate journalists, basically. So, like, first of all, weird way to greet someone who you know is a journalist. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> I did think, for how much I do I'm dogging on this film, I did think that the scene where they're having the dinner when Giorgio's uh, invited to stay for dinner with them, uh, which they're eating salad during that dinner, by the way. Notice that, and that's where the bodies are buried, so it's kind of gross. Um, the scene, that scene where they're sitting there eating, like the camera work, how it kind of like moves all the way around the table as the conversation's going on, that was pretty cool. That actually looked pretty good. But then they did it like two more times, and I was just like, okay, 
the first time you did it, it was cool and it looked good. The second time I was like, okay, I mean, it still kind of looks good, but yeah. And then the third time I was like, okay, we, we, we've been doing this enough. So it was just kind of funny. At that point, it was kind of like motion sickness going on. Yeah. Eleonora and Parisi shoot each other a look when Dr. Dalla says he has a very impulsive temperament. This is kind of meant to be a hint of what's going on. And at that time, he's, I think, I'm not sure if, it, if it's when he's saying this at the table, but at that time he's eating, they make a point of showing him eating the lettuce. So that's like kind of hint of what's going on here. And then he's talking about his impulsive temperament and then the look, look is shot between Eleonora and Parisi and that's to me seemed like an indicator that Dala was the killer now by the end of the film it, them shooting the look doesn't make sense from the standpoint of them having any inkling or knowing that he was the killer because nothing like nothing about, like that comes out like they don't say oh I knew it was you or anything but it's not great writing. So, yeah. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, Giorgio certainly doesn't waste any time forgetting about Erica. Uh, he sees Sarah and he's just like, oh? or his penis is like, oh? and then he sees Lucia. And actually, Lucia sees him first, I think. She's the one who kind of initiates the eye contact and the um, I want to bone you eyes. <laughs> and then it just becomes like a sexcapade, basically. Like the movie derails from what it actually should be which is solving this case and finding erica and figuring out who the killer is it eventually comes back to it but the majority of the film is just like a sex capade in essence and then some people do die but uh it's just funny to me like all the creeping around that giorgio does you know he eventually has sex with sarah he gets close to having sex with lucia uh yeah what the hell <laughs> The camera in the statue was an interesting little thing to introduce. That's the whole uh, Parisi's thought capturing camera, which I didn't really understand. Um, it's very, once again, very left field, like a lot of the stuff in this film. But when it was first introduced and they don't tell you what it is, it was interesting because I thought, oh, he's taking pictures of people. He's kind of surveilling what's going on. He's He's one of these people who just likes to take pictures of people when they don't know what's going on. And, and that could be like an interesting character aspect. But no, it wasn't that. It was something way weirder and didn't make sense. Wow, Lucia's throwing herself at Giorgio too. This guy crushes ass. Yes, he does. But shouldn't he be looking for Erica? Yes, I, that was something I was wondering the whole time, as you can tell by my notes. I laughed when Giorgio went looking for Lucia and Alberto creepily walks out of the shadows in that one room that he assumed was Lucia's room. He just like, it's like he was waiting for him. I, and I think he was, I think he was waiting for him because he was trying to break it up. Now what's really unclear is, you know, we know, and I'll talk about it later, what, who Alberto really was in the end. So the question is, who was Lucia? Was Lucia just an actual uh, maid or was she in league with Alberto? I don't know. That's what I'm trying to figure out. But maybe there's not an answer. Doesn't seem like it. What a long, awkward sex scene between Giorgio and Lucia. Oh yeah, he did have sex with her. That's right. He did. Yep. So much went on. Um, yeah, it's just a long, awkward sex scene that went on. Really, really, you know, and I, I think that that was the same in Trauma as well, that film. <laughs> just the same weird sex. Um... So the whole Lucia, or I'm sorry, Parisi photographing people's thoughts, I love the fact that it's in this film because it's so ridiculous. What I like most, though, is how crazy his little room with all the equipment is when he's developing the thought photos, um, like the flashing different colored lights going on, the weird noises and kind of like otherworldly music that's being played, him like toiling and looking so serious and like almost mad scientist-like. Um, I, I like that aspect of it. I think it's kind of funny. Cool shot when it shows Alberto driving and Lucia running on separate levels. When Alberto went to take off, I think he was going to see about like someone's mental state. It must have been Dr. Dalla, but they, I don't think they tell you at that point. And Lucia's running after him when outside. And he's in the car, and it's kind of like on this lower level driving under that bridge that we 
see later and she's like on the grass on that higher level and they're kind of going at the same time and it just looked cool like it was a inspired good looking camera shot um lucia just wants penis any penis really and that's what we end up seeing when the simpleton shows up randomly outside and then she's just like oh well let's just get it on behind this bush then when she's done getting it on with him she's like getting dressed and she like shoes him away and tells him, get out of here you beast like she refers to him as a beast as like not even saying that he's like a real person it's interesting the scene of Parisi with his machine seems like he's making music. That's another thing to point out, but I liked the look of it. Uh, during Lucia's death scene, there are some real weird cuts. And Lu Lucia's acting is not good, which makes it funny, which adds to the charm of how bad this film is. Uh, but there were some really rough, like, weird cuts during that scene. If you go back and watch, there's, like, two of them where it's, like, something's going on and then it's, like, there's a jump in time. And things just like definitely look different, but shouldn't. There's, it's real rough in my opinion. But what do you expect? With the amount of time hearing the noise while the thought camera is working, I actually thought I was gonna lose it. That does go on too long. I know I said I kind of liked that, but the aspect I didn't like was how long that noise slash music was going on. That kind of gets to you over time. I love the scene of Parisi frantically wheeling around yelling for Alberto. When he's figured it out that it's Dr. Dalla, which I guess is his brother or brother-in-law, I don't know. And he's like frantically wheeling around like yelling for Alberto. He's like, Alberto, Alberto. And then he eventually finds Dr. Dalla over Lucia's body. And I guess he was planning on carving it up and then just burying pieces in his salad garden. I don't know. Um, what a series of events with Alberto chasing and shooting Dalla, then he falls off the bridge and under a tractor or tractor type thing. I'm just going to call it a tractor. But the timing of that was impeccable, am I right? The fact that he was running, gets shot, gets onto the bridge at the right time, and then falls off it just in time to get right under that tractor. Convenient writing. Not a surprise. It was funny. But there was this moment, too, like when when uh, Parisi uh, initially finds Dalla over Lucia's body, it, it was really weird because there was this dialogue where Dalla like says to Parisi, no, you killed her. And it's like he's trying to convince him that he's the killer, which is just this kind of like weird moment. Once again, I like it. I like how weird. Alberto revealing himself as a private investigator is hilarious. This is the moment I probably laughed at the most because it's unbelievably absurd. This whole thing where he's like, I'm not a butler, I'm a private investigator, and I've been onto this case for months. I was just like, what? And then that's when I was thinking, well, what about Lucia? Because it seems like there was some sort of like, something that Lucia and Alberto were talking about during the film that they didn't specifically say what it is. It was just like a between them conversations that the audience is left out of so was she working with him or not and in which case if she was working with him why was she so focused on just boning everyone because she should have been doing her job doesn't make sense that's fine we don't need that so the quote at the very end of the film that moment where they are showing dala's salad garden and the simpleton is there like crouching over it then they pop he starts he's laughing and they pop up this quote this is the quote mankind differs from beasts for an incurable evil intelligence is this to say the only non-evil character is the simpleton's son since he's a simpleton and is actually called a beast at one point by lucia so within the quote referencing beast which is probably why lucia called him a beast Basically trying to say everyone has problems, everyone's kind of bad to some degree, except this dude. I don't know. I don't know if they were trying to say that or not. And is it saying that being too intelligent can drive one to madness? I think it probably is a quote just kind of saying that as human beings, because we have higher intellects than animals, there's a tendency for us to become so intelligent that it drives us to insanity and then we become evil brutes like Dr. Dalla. Obviously, he's very intelligent because he's a doctor, but he, you know, his his level of intelligence just drives him over the edge and then he becomes this murdering maniac. I kind of feel like that's the point of it. Okay. 
Uh, note, there was a bit of a hint at dinner table with them focusing on the lettuce. Yes, that was their, their little kind of laugh at you, audience, because you don't know where the bodies are. Uh, a bunch of shots of actors when they are, aren't delivering lines look like they're being held as hostages. Yeah, there's some really terrible moments of like the camera focusing on the face of an actor or actress when they're not delivering lines. And the way they were like looking was like literally like this. It was like... <laughs> it was this total like, what do I do now type thing. Uh, really weird. Just really weird. But... It adds to the charm of how bad it is. Lots of scenes uh, that are overly long with not much going on and no music like I already talked about. And obviously the main purpose of this film is nudity, as we can see, because there's a lot of nudity just shoehorned in. And that's why you have the majority of the film being Giorgio's intended sexual conquests, basically. No plot to get in the way of the nudity, in essence. So... That's my assessment of The Police Are Blundering in the Dark. I'm very interested to get to the last film in here, The Killer is One of Thirteen, and see how that kind of rounds out the volume. And then obviously back here, whoop, right here, I have Volume 2. So we'll see how those stack up against Volume 1. Now, I said I would need to rate this two different ways. So in the pantheon of films as a overall film, I'm going to give this... One out of five stars. This is not a good film at all. It is not good. I mean, there are a few kind of nice moments, but not a good film. Now, as a so bad it's good film, I'm going to give it a pretty solid three star rating. Uh, I was between three and three and a half on the so bad it's good, but I'm going to go three. It's not. I don't think it's quite to the three and a half. So, if you have seen this film, I would love to hear your thoughts on this film. Do you actually like it as a film? Do you think it's so bad it's good? Your thoughts. Put them in the comments. Uh, yeah, let's talk about it. I'd be excited to. And just Giallo in general if you want to. But do me a quick favor. Hit that subscribe button. Uh, that is your best way to repay me if you like this video or any video I've ever done. Because that's what motivates me. That's what keeps me going. When I see people subscribing, I know that you are actually appreciating what I'm doing. And that further motivates me to do more. Because I'm not, you know, this isn't a job for me or anything. It's a, it's a hobby. Just doing it for fun. But anyway, oh, also hit the notification bell button because then you'll know when I put up new videos, blah, blah, blah. Regardless, thank you for checking this out, taking your time to do that. I do appreciate that big time. Uh, and until next time, keep it brutal.